What is up, my heroes of the grind? It is I, the sassy mask salesman. You have met with a terrific fate, haven't you? Because you found me. I have sought the truth of this world. I have read the dead Sheikah scrolls. I have snuck into the princess's sacred realm and laid eyes upon her golden triangle. I have broken into ancient tombs just to listen to the lingering butthurt of the dead. I have traveled far and took in the stories of the different peoples of these lands. And as you may have noticed, I even acquired a postman's hat so that I might molest people's juicy mail for leads. But enough about my methods. Today, I present to you the ultimate legend of Zelda theory. Now then, what do you think you know about links? Of course, I shouldn't have to tell you that there's more than one link. Actually, there's a lot more than one link. You see, the links come from a special bloodline. This bloodline is the product of thousands of years of selective breeding. Newborn Hylian babies would be thrown off cliffs onto jagged rocks below to test their durability. Only those that passed this test by surviving were deemed worthy. And then, after minimal training, these children were thrown into secret dungeons, full of traps and monsters, to weed out the weak. Only one child was allowed to leave these dungeons alive, which explains why so many links have autism, because their ancestors were never allowed to work as a collective. Link also has extremely weak breeding instincts. He never gets the girl and always gets cut. This is because all the mating was done for his ancestors and they never had to put in the effort. So over many generations, this instinct faded away. Another thing about Link, and we'll just stick with the singular Link, but you know what I mean. Another thing about Link is that he has a hardwired autistic obsession with chess, keys, maps, and compasses that he doesn't even need. And even when he's not in hostile territory, he has a hard time with the concept of personal property. He will literally walk through any unlocked door and take any provisions he deems useful, while the inhabitants know full well to treat him like a force of nature not to be reckoned with. Not that anybody tells them, it's just easy to sense that something's a little off about that boy and they should stay clear. So as a result of the whole cliff throwing onto jagged rocks thing and other ordeals that his ancestors were put through, Link is incredibly tough, to the point where his skin can't be pierced, which is why he never bleeds, and his bones are stronger than steel. Even the mightiest of blows couldn't compromise his body's integrity. To cut to the chase, the only way to actually kill Link is to cause internal damage to his heart by hitting him really hard or otherwise bypassing his unbreakable, unpierceable shell. But even then, he still has spare hearts and blood stored in another dimension that automatically teleports into his chest whenever his heart takes damage. In order to replenish his spare hearts and blood, Link extracts life force from living things by killing and injuring them, similar to how sluts extract life force out of men by sucking the vitamin D out of them. This includes, of course, cutting grass and smashing the small, adorable creatures that like to live inside empty pottery, as well as the creepy crawlies that live underneath rocks, and so on and so forth. He can also increase his total heart capacity by killing creatures with particularly strong life force, or by sucking it out of stones made of condensed crystallized blood from these kinds of creatures, which people often keep as family heirlooms. So Link is basically a vampire, and is basically unbeatable so long as he sucks that life force harder than he sucks at fighting. Now another trait of Link's is that he's very strong. So strong in fact, that from a young age he begins to fear his own strength, which causes a psychological barrier on its use, which he can only overcome with the use of special placebo meme bracelets and other such trinkets, which allow him to tap deeper into his true strength, but only for very specific purposes, because, as we'll get into, there's always the risk that a Link could go rogue. Now with all this said, Link does have some pretty major physical flaws. While his massively suppressed strength is still impressive and he has a great deal of stamina, Link actually has bad knees and often struggles with running and jumping because of the pain it causes him, although some Links are tougher than others. Ironically, his spirit animal is the rabbit, a creature notorious for hopping around and breeding freely. Also, Links can be knocked out, but it's more of a reflex than a significant concussion. Now this breeding program I mentioned created many people with the same bloodline scattered them all over the place and kept their abilities hidden even from themselves, which is accomplished through advanced hypnosis as well as various types of drugs and abuse from a young age. And as a result, these members of the bloodline live relatively normal and low-key lives unless it's supposed to specific triggers. Whenever the Hyrulean royals feel like they're in danger, they summon their chosen servants, the Sheikah, to locate and activate a link. Soon after activation, a link is usually paired with a companion of some sort to act as his turd wrangler for lack of a better term. You see, because of his autism, Link often fails to see the bigger picture. So it's these Link Wrangler's jobs to keep applying pressure that keeps Link moving in the right direction. They repeat themselves all the time and point out completely obvious details just to make sure that things go smoothly. So you may have wondered why Links get activated at a relatively young age, sometimes even as children. Well, the Hyrulean Royals have a rule that the Links shouldn't be activated after they reach a certain age. This is 
because over the years, their autism-induced celibacy creates an unquenchable bitterness and rage in them, and if activated too far into this process, there's a serious risk of them going rogue and evolving into dark wizard vampires that suck the life out of the land itself and command armies of reanimated sex dolls made from the corpses of the hottest women in the lands. This is also the reason why after completing his missions, Link is stripped of all his equipment, and most of his powers are sucked out of him in his sleep by a suck you bye bye a special type of bed bug that robs him of his energy and magic power, reducing him to but a shadow of his former self. But even then, Link is always a risk for causing some damage when he gets cucked one too many times. <laughs> Those inferior dullards. Link's Triforce of Courage represents the mountain of dead children sacrificed to create his bloodline. It provides him with the power of natural selection in its stream environments. But this Triforce only fully manifests on the back of Link's hand after seven straight years of no fat, which allows his powers to fully mature. The more he fails at this, the more the Master Sword in his hands becomes soft and ineffectual. Now, during the post-war events surrounding the Ocarina of Time, the Link of that era, later known as the Hero of Time, was born to a single mom during the war. This mother, who who of course was a member of the bloodline, stopped receiving benefits during the wartime economy. So she first fled to Death Mountain, hoping to find a good Goron man to take her in. She aimed to please, but none of them really wanted to put up with the fact that she already had a son. And after being injured by a Goron peepee, -pee, she fled to the forest, where she dumped, I mean left her kid, in the care of the Great Deku Tree, who immediately recognized that the boy was of the special bloodline and could prove useful, so he was put through all the basic mind control stuff. Although when this infant Link arrived, he already had a couple screws loose, which sped up the process. His mom actually made a full recovery, and the Hero of Time met a couple of his half-brothers in Goron City, although he wasn't aware. Now of course, Link wouldn't even exist if it weren't for the royal family which he was painstakingly bred to serve. He is their Knights Templar of the Golden Triangle, and occasionally the top elf servant for when the king wants to hand out presents to the little boys and girls of Hyrule. Santa confirmed. To do this job, Link has access to a bag that leads into another dimension, which answers a few questions like how can he carry so much stuff, and how he can carry iron boots but their weight only takes effect when he puts them on. So about the king, I'm sure you probably know that the goal in the game of chess is to isolate the king. It's a great metaphor for how powerful powerful people can easily fall. The hard way to do this is to try and go straight through all their followers and servants. But the easiest way is to focus on isolating the king because they alone have no power. Kings are only strong because of their servants. Now there's a certain phenomenon that's happened all too often within the Hyrulean royal family's dynasty. You see the queen tends to end up cucking the king because she's so dissatisfied with his gay tendencies. He only really married her to use as breeding cattle in the first place and doesn't really care about her. What he does care about more than anything in the world is tall soldiers. They are his weakness and the most beautiful beautiful girl or woman in the world is a matter of indifference to the king. In fact, this little habit of his is the main reason why Hylian soldiers are so useless. Hyrule so often fails to produce a single warrior, and their command structure really suffers since the king really wants those tall soldiers with him in the war room. This, as you would expect, is a big reason why Link is needed. So now that we have that established, the way that things usually play out is that the king gets cucked by the queen, so he ends up carriage bombing her and covering up his tracks, which is why you never hear about the queen. Now the king charges himself as the keeper of the holy grail of Hyrule, the Triforce. Even though the three golden triangles are actually associated with people other than him. As you may have suspected, there is in fact a fourth Triforce hiding in plain sight. It exists in the void and is known as the Triforce of Power Bottoms. The king has a certain tragic quality to him. He is afflicted with frailty, low energy, and a wound on his inner thigh. And by inner, I mean he has a spiritual wound to his dick that makes him favor the company of men in the wee hours of the night. He is effectively quite impotent, and his faggotry has depleted the fertility of the lands themselves, leaving the kingdom in danger of being culturally enriched. And on that Topic. There was a time in the history of Hyrule when the men of the low inhibition Gerudo tribe were out breeding and molesting Hyrulean women. This was such an issue that the king of Hyrule pleaded with the golden goddesses through his Triforce and managed to cast a curse on them which changed their genetics so that the vast, vast majority of those born to the Gerudo tribe would be female. And the one male that gets born every hundred years or so is proclaimed king of the Gerudos. By far the most famous of these kings, Ganondorf, has similar issues to that of the king of Hyrule, except he just fucked everything that moved. No goat was safe. Now you see, during the post-war era of the Hero of Time, Princess Zelda actually plotted against her presumed father the king and teamed up with Ganondorf. She knew that the king favored homosexuals and that as a result of him pushing policies that support the homos, she would lose a lot of political power. So she had Link collect the royal jewels from the three tribes that the Hylian royals had subjugated, having had Ganondorf orchestrate things so that these tribes would be ingratiated to Link enough to hand over the stones. This was a way to test Ganondorf's loyalty, as well as a way to make the Hylians look good to these tribes through Link, with these royal jewels being displayed 
in the Temple of Time as a symbol of their loyalty, and then she further tricked Link into opening the way to have Ganondorf enter the Sacred Realm, where he acquired the Triforce of Power, which he was actually fated to acquire one way or another anyways. So using the Triforce of Power, Ganondorf forcibly became the new King of Hyrule. During this period as King, Ganondorf created policies to hang the gays, because he has self-hating queer tendencies. That's what happens when you're surrounded by nothing but women. Now Zelda had predicted all of this, and after seven years of reign, she felt that he had served his purpose. So while in disguise, she led Link to repopulate the Hall of Sages, which I'll talk about soon. With this task completed, she revealed herself as a traitor to Ganondorf. <laughs> This led to Link beating the piss out of Ganondorf so that she could seal him away. With his task completed, Zelda then sends Link back seven years in time, creating her own timeline where she rules her kingdom and has regular conjugal visits with Ganondorf. Now Link, even with all his autism, realized that he got cucked on that one. So he marches over to the young princess back in the past and just starts talking mad shit about Ganondorf, making up lies about how useless and disloyal he was to her in the future, which convinces her to abandon her plans and instead urge the king to have Ganondorf executed, which most certainly led to a big mess because as I mentioned, the guy is fated to possess the Triforce of Power. So on another note, Zelda is the head sage of the Hall of Sages, also known as the Wise Guys of Hyrule. Usually, the sages are comprised of high-ranking and influential members of the Hyrulean nobility, but exceptions are made under special circumstances. Members of other tribes are admitted so long as they maintain an understanding that they go along with the schemes of the Hyrulean royals and nobility, even, nay, especially when it's at the expense of their own people. The sages also, by the way, double as the archbishops of the Hylian religion. They help keep the royals in power, by propagating an ideology which involves the royal line being descended from the goddess Hylia, granting them some of those divine right to rule points. Which is strange, considering they have a temple to the goddess of time, not this Hylia. Furthermore, isn't it a bit of a coincidence that both Hylia and the goddess Naru are associated with herps, and both of them are also associated with time-based powers. And Zelda's Triforce of Wisdom is the one associated with Naru. And also, you might consider this a petty detail, but the Ocarina of Time, it's blue, Naru's color. So I deposit to you that the goddess of time is Naru. And the goddess Hylia is a rebranded Naru, re-envisioned in the image of the royal family's princess, so that they could then go on to claim to have divine roots. Anywho, Zelda is the boss of bosses of the Sage Hall Commission, and her word is final. Her Triforce of Wisdom actually doubles as the other Triforce of Power, seeing as wisdom is power. The only problem is that all the wisdom in the world can't stop her from being a woman, and things will often go awry, to the point where she has to be bailed out by summoning a link. Now, the royal family actually has another secret power, and that power is its extended family. They have many relatives who occupy influential positions in Hylian society. And although these blood ties are played down in front of the peasantry, they take full advantage of these family connections. For example, by covertly propping up distant members of their clan as celebrities in order to influence the Hylian youth, which in practice often involves getting them to act really, really gay. They also do what they can to disrupt poor families in order to keep this family advantage to themselves. Manipulating things so that they experience poverty is a simple and effective means. Because when the economy is fucked, women tend to chimp out at their husbands for not providing, and extended family members don't want anything to do with you because they can barely feed themselves and would assume that you would only contact them because you want something which would affect their ability to survive. So screwing with the economy breaks up poor families while the nobility stays strong. That is if they are on good terms with the royals because power trumps wealth. But they're all pretty much related to the point of inbreeding anyways. The royals have a lot of trusted agents that are related to them such as Guru Guru. During the Hero of Time era this guy played the Song of Storms in Kakariko just loud enough to keep the rain clouds away from Gerudo territory. He also very slyly teaches the song to Link, convincing the boy to believe in a literal time paradox. Now, another thing that the Hylian nobility likes to do is support women getting into positions of power when they don't belong there. They sit in these positions, basically just being there to troll, as they have neither the inclination or capacity to innovate, and a lack of innovation means a lack of new jobs being created. It's a big part of the reason why after 10,000 years, Hyrule is still castles and knights. A big part of the reason why these noble elites push these women upwards is because it gives them more options, seeing as these women are unlikely to settle for these mere peasant Hylian and men that they left behind. They're basically dragging Hylian society down because they're a bunch of perverts who want more and more advantages. Like who puts a woman who is allergic to cuckoos in charge of the cuckoos? Someone who has a lot of interest in cucking you, that's who. They also use these women as meat shields, getting them to implement a lot of the really nasty policies and ideas so that they receive the blame with a lot of people assuming that it's the result of simple incompetence. Now a lot of Hylian men have certain effeminate ways about them. You know, they're a little too happy. There's a couple reasons for this, a few of which I've already mentioned. But the big secret is those very 
very birds whose likeness is portrayed proudly on the Hylian shields. They're called Loftwings, and the royal family maintains a coop full of them. They feed these birds foods containing massive amounts of estrogens, and then set them loose into the skies of Hyrule, where they fart out chemical trails so potent that the frogs start turning gay. Frankly speaking, the Hylian's worst enemy is other Hylians. So I've talked a fair bit about the Hylians. Now let's look at the other major peoples living in Hyrule. The Gerudos are known to mate with Hylians, with whom they share common roots. Evidence of this can be found all over Hyrule if one knows where to look. During the Hero of Time era, within the temples and dungeons of Hyrule could be found stone cubes bearing the symbol of the Gerudo. Now located deep within the Gerudo desert is the Spirit Temple, which features two large statues of the Goddess of the Sands. Now a bit of a case could be made for this actually being the Goddess of Power Din, but it's far from conclusive. More importantly though, the Goddess on the inside of the temple has the Triforce, the symbol of the royal family on her palm, where Link has to play a special song known only to the royal family and their servants in order to progress any further in the temple. Also in the desert is the Arbiter's Grounds, where the sages have held executions. This place has strikingly similar goddess statues to the Goddess of the Sands, and the architecture of the place also features both Gerudo and Triforce symbolism, which once upon a time was a great sea that receded and gave way to lush green pastures, later becoming too dry and experiencing desertification. Now here's the thing, the goddess Naru is not only associated with time, but with law. And since Arbiter means judge, it's highly likely that the goddesses depicted in the Arbiter's grounds are just another rebranding of Nauru, while this goddess of the sands that is more associated with the Gerudo is related to this goddess, but evolved to have a bit more of a din side to better suit the Gerudo. So the TLDR version is that the Gerudo and the Hylians have sister religions that were once one, but branched off as the two people split apart, with the Hylians migrating for greener pastures and the Gerudos being left behind. Now I did mention already that the Hyrulean Sandy Cousins are more sexual aggressive and overall less inhibited. And there's a good reason for this. It has to do with their difficult environment. You see, death is always lurking in the desert, and only those who are more frisky and impulsive would have enough kids to compensate for losses and have their genes live on. And as I mentioned, this nature of theirs is what caused the Hyrulean king to cast a curse on them, to keep the Hylian phenotype and the Hyrulean identity that the royals tie themselves to from being overtaken by low inhibition foreigners. Now in most timelines, the last appearance of a full-on Gerudo society was in the post-war era, after they had lost to their pale cousin and their allies in the so-called Hyrulean Civil War. In this era, they were officially led by King Ganondorf and unofficially led by these two old hags. Ganondorf is the interrupted continuation of a long bloodline of Gerudo kings, a bloodline that is significantly more mixed with that of the other major peoples of Hyrule as a result of political unions that serve different ends throughout the years than the blood of the average Gerudo. Even though, as king, all of the Gerudo carry some of his genes, he's so mixed that, largely due to his Goron genes actually, he's got a distinct green pigmentation. His bloodline has become intertwined with the Triforce of Power, such that, upon every Gerudo King's death, this Triforce starts altering the threads of fate, meticulously bringing the genetic pieces of his bloodline which still exist in the world back together, so that a new king would be born, too powerful and too diverse to be held back by any mere curse. Ganondorf's bloodline actually goes as far back as a man named Demise, who definitely couldn't be called a Gerudo. Demise had rocky skin, a wide nose bridge, and a strong affiliation with fire and earth. According to official Hyrulean historical accounts, Demise first emerged from underground with an army of demons to conquer the lands, but that's not exactly true. Demise was actually a Goron, but not just your average Goron, he was a special mutant Goron, born so powerful that his tribe had to recognize him as king. Hyrulean historians would later revise history and refer to his followers as demons, because they wanted the Hylians to be more accepting of Gorons in later eras, which once again I'll get into later. Now Demise attacked the proto-Hylians of his era, who weren't actually living in the sky, but behind walls. The gate was first opened for Demise by a dangerous homosexual named Girahim, who was infatuated with the man. Demise's intentions were to get the Hylians blacked by his followers. And of course, by blacked, I'm just referring to a meme about people getting wrecked. Anyway, so obviously this attack failed, and I'll get into the reason why soon enough. But basically, in the end, the Gorons were pushed back to their homeland called Death Mountain, and Demise's bloodline found its way to becoming the royal line of the Gerudo, mostly as a result of his descendants taking advantage of the rich resources of Death Mountain to make connections and seize power within the Gerudo tribe, hoping that through this tribe, revenge could be had on the Hylians for what they did to Demise's Goron brother. Which again, I'll get into later. Now, fast forward back to Ganondorf. He was raised by two old witches named Kaumei and Kotake. These two witches use magic seals bearing the symbols of the fire and water sages. And that's because, just like the sages, they serve the interests of the Hyrulean royals, who actually control the temple, which explains the Hyrulean crest gateways inside. Because the truth is, they and their Sheikah servants are the main people in control of the Gerudo religion as well. These two old witches are only half Gerudo and are related to a prominent family of Hyrulean witches, which includes Maple, Syrup, 
as well as that old hag in Kakariko. The family business is actually potion selling, which these two are also involved in when Link meets them in Termina. These two witches share Ganondorf's peculiar greenish pigmentation, except for them it's the result of their failing organs. Anyways, these two were trained by the Sheikah to become experts in brainwashing, a skill set which they used to influence young Gerudo kings, like how they convinced Ganondorf to lead his people into an unwinnable war with the Hylians and their allies. Well, actually, the Gerudo might have stood a chance if it wasn't for all their periods having synchronized. These witches manipulated Ganondorf by taking advantage of the love that he had developed for the Gerudo people, and his desire to grant them a better life in more prosperous lands. This fondness for his people was also the reason why he surrendered and agreed to be Zelda's pawn when the war was lost. Rather than fleeing at the last minute to save his own skin and leaving the tribe to their fate, he knew full well that surrendering could have easily led to his own execution. In fact, in one timeline it did. Later on, when Ganondorf attacks Hyrule Castle Town on Zelda's orders, he does it with his men, in other words, his mercenary band of Moblins, since there's no Gerudo males but him. Now you might be thinking, Moblins don't count as men, they're just monsters. To that I say, Moblins are bipedal, and at least some are known to talk, to wield weapons, to come up with plans of their own, and even to have a basic concept of money. So the only reason left to call them monsters and not men, I mean aside from their behavior, is that they're just so god dang ugly, but they're men enough to be roped into this with promises of Hylian booty, and then get butchered like pig dogs by Ganondorf once they had reached the sacred realm. They had become liabilities at that point, which is the same reason why Link was directed to kill those two old witches once they had outlived their usefulness, their final mission having been to brainwash this chick Nubaru, so that she could become one of Zelda's sages and be placed in charge of the Gerudo. And it wasn't long before the Gerudo became a dead civilization, with its patriarch who would sacrifice everything for them, having been sealed away with an undying body granted by the Triforce of Power. Soon enough, all he could do was go mad and wish for death knowing that, until his death, a new king can't be born to lead and serve his people. You could say that Ganondorf was the demise of the Gerudo. The Gerudo phenotype didn't completely die out though, as a little further down the main timeline, in a time period called the Era of Twilight, the residents of Hyrule were looking a lot more mixed than they used to, with many of them having Gerudo looking features. Even Princess Zelda herself no longer had her classic golden blonde hair. It stands to reason, if it wasn't for the curse placed on the Gerudo, they would have completely taken over Hyrule, while the royals lose all legitimacy with the population, for reasons that really just come down to them not being genetically similar enough to the new people of Hyrule. The Gorons too would have taken this chance to take a big piece of the Hylian pie. And on that note, let's talk about the Gorons and their history. The story of the Gorons begins with their homeland of Death Mountain, a region which can be hazardous and where many ferocious beasts roam, but also a bountiful one. A place very rich in mineral resources, and for the Gorons, little excuse to go hungry. Most of their problems in the post-war era are actually a result of outside meddling. The Hylian nobles had taken note of two things. One, being, of course, the rich resources of Death Mountain, the other being the impressive durability and endurance of the Gorons when compared to the Hylians. They hatched a plan to take advantage of both. First, they got a group of Hylians to colonize Death Mountain and then, having the royal Sheikah agents introduce to the Gorons what would become known as their special crop, known to some as the bomb flower, which, for obvious reasons, would prove very useful for mining. But the less talked about aspect of this plant is that its fruit can be ground down into a fine powder, one which, when taken into the body, produces a strong euphoria and has the user exploding with energy. It was known as Black Black, and it was very addictive, especially in its more concentrated form, which was developed by the Sheikah, who then convinced one of the Gorons, with promises of riches, to market this new product to his people. The one who who took this deal became known as Hot Rodder Goron. He carried the biggest bomb bag in Goron City, just full of the stuff. And despite laws imposed on the Gorons, which make possession illegal, nothing ever seemed to happen to him. All of the Gorons, except for those in the know of course, became hopelessly addicted to the stuff. To feed their habit, many of them went to work in the highly owned mine known as Dudongo's Cavern, where they extracted rupees and other resources which were exported, massively increasing the wealth of the Hylian royals and other nobles who invested in this project. The owners of this mine fed the Goron workers rock sirloin and sometimes as a treat, cavern fried dudongo, all secretly sprinkled with the Goron's special spice, just to make sure they keep coming back. It got to a point where the Gorons would rather starve than eat rocks that didn't come from dudongo's cavern. There were those who didn't want to work though, and seeing as Gorons have impulsive natures, and seeing as Sheikah meddling has made their culture very degenerate by this point, there were those who took to committing crimes, usually against their fellow Gorons, to get their fix. While some would be hired by the Hylian nobles and Sheikah to come down from the mountains and peddle their special spice to the lower class Hylians, seeing as Hylian 
alien men weren't slick enough to get away with it for long compared with other breeds. At any rate, the Gorons gained a reputation for committing a lot of crimes, which led to the Hylians supporting the idea of using public funds to build the Fire Temple, an absolutely maximum security prison, located deep within the caldera of Death Mountain, where Gorons were regularly fed to the mascot dragon Volvagia. Now, at this point, another thing to note about the Gorons is that they're hypersexual, which is why they gave prominent creatures around them such names as Dudongos and Volvagia, and why they got in the habit of calling each other brothers, because nobody really knows who fathered who. Gorons also have aggressive natures, and the one thing they truly respect is power. Gorons who grew up in Goron City, which is actually an old mine that was rezoned as a housing project for the workers in Dudongo's cavern, where only the big boss man who serves the Hylian royals even gets the front door, where living in such close quarters where degeneracy reigns has led to massive tensions and violence, with the strong always preying on the weak. Gorons growing up in the city develop a deep-seated fear and repulsion to homosexuals. This fear gives way to terror, as later in life, many of them find themselves in the Fire Temple. So this prison sucked up a lot of public funds and was a major cash cow for its owners for quite some time. That is, until one fateful day. Big Goron is someone who isn't hearing anybody who tries to say that size doesn't matter. In fact, due to his size, which makes him completely incompatible with any living female, some prominent Hylians and even the Zora King had befriended him, just to have a token Goron friend without feeling in danger of getting cucked. One day, Big Goron got so sick and tired of not having a suitable partner that even Death Mountain itself started looking appealing. So naturally, the Gorons imprisoned at the Fire Temple took advantage of the structural damage that this event had caused. They rioted and poured out down the mountain. One of them even found a big hammer and used it to give the badge a good pounding. Eyewitness testimony of the events of that day would, in later eras, lead to the Fire Temple being renamed as Spectacle Rock. Anyways, all of these Gorons returning from the prison led to a classic case of Hylian flight, with the colonists abandoning their settlements on Death Mountain, leaving just the Sheikah village of Kakariko at the bottom of Death Mountain Trail. This village acted as the buffer zone between Death Mountain and Hyrule. These Sheikah would continue to send agents to spread degeneracy in Goron society, and at the same time worked hard to secure their border, knowing that if for whatever reason the Gorons poured down from the mountain into Hyrule, they would be the first to get blacked. Now, centuries later, long after this village had become just a regular Hylian village, for reasons I'll get into later, the Gorons had developed advanced mining technology based on knowledge acquired from the Hylians. They mined many valuable materials and became very economically strong, with the average Goron now being more wealthy than the average Hylian man. And by by the way, you're probably wondering by now where all the Goron women are. The fact is, you just don't see their women around Hyrule. With all these male Gorons you do see looking to mate with Hylian women, their unions always produce more Gorons anyways, and their newfound wealth would only speed up this process. Now the next group I'll talk about is the Aquatic Zora people. According to legend, their story all began with the invention of the Iron Boots. These boots were designed for the Hylian nobility, so that they could make those who crossed them sleep with the fishes, a phrase which over time led to some misunderstandings, such that some Hylian men would put on a pair of iron boots of their own violation and engage in carnal acts with the aquatic wildlife. Eventually, the unthinkable happened when one such union actually led to an offspring and the rest is fish history. One remnant of this history is the fishing pond guy, whose ancestors ran a very lucrative business catering to some of the most perverted of the Hylians. Anyways, ever since then, the boots have become a symbol of the relationship between the Hylians and the Zora. Now, Zora are generally classified into one of two categories, the violent and territorial river Zoras, also known as the cartel. Only only the very top rank river zorers are willing to communicate with Hylians. The rest immediately open fire on anyone who is unwelcome in their territory. The other category of Zora are sometimes called the Sea Zora. In the post-war era, they live at Zora's domain, which is way up Zora River, past the Beaner Man, and behind a waterfall. Zora's domain is actually a spawning ground for their kind, which is part of the reason why they made it so difficult to reach, where Zoras have to literally swim up a waterfall. It's a test of their genetic stock, where only Zoras who can gain entry get to pass on their genes to the next generation. The Zora Royals, 
though, don't have to go through these kinds of tests, and instead have become very unfit after many generations lived in luxury. Their rule is backed up by the Hyrulean royals, with whom they are distant relatives, which is the real reason why the Zora royal line always seems to survive catastrophes that devastate the rest of the Zora. Now here's where it gets greasy. The Zora royals, and by extension the Hyrulean royals, are in fact in charge of the river Zora. They are just one arm of the control that they have over the flow of certain resources, and depending on their choices, the cartel could be suppressed at the point where most don't even notice their activities, or their violence could be allowed to spill over onto the riverbanks. Now with that established, it is through their control of the waterways that the Zora cartel supply certain substances to the Hylians from beyond Hyrule's border. These river Zora also serve as a form of border control, as anyone trying to enter the kingdom along the waterways would be met with their sheer violence. Zoras are masters of secret passageways, using underwater shortcut routes for their own purposes. They always seem to be popping up out of random bodies of water, so the Hylians nicknamed them wetbacks. Speaking of which, to the Hylians, Zora's domain is like a resort. Hylian men often like to get away from their wives by saying that they're going fishing with a wallet full of rupees. In other words, they're off to spend their piggy banks on banging cheap Zora women, with their excuse being a perfect cover for the smell. And fishing pond guy will cover for them if any angry wives come ask. Now, like I said, the cartel controls the inflow of certain resources into Hyrule. And what could be more important and essential than the supply of fresh water itself? In fact, they have advanced infrastructure in place to do just that. Like their big fish deity that plugs up the river, or the water lake bed temple, which works like an adjustable drain in the sink basically, granting them, and by extension the Hyrulean royals that back up their monarchy, the power to cause a drought, or even flood Hyrule, which allows them, for example, a covert way to sap the strength of peasants who have started getting too uppity. Now the Zoras have different fates in different timelines, but the one thing that stays consistent is that they don't fare too well after the invention of the toilet, having all that waste pumped into lakes and oceans, carrying fecal filiac superbugs that devastate the Zora to the point where there's only one way out, to evolve. Now the Deku are the bush people of Hyrule. Now most of the Deku are actually just scrubs, and most of them are mad about it, cause who wants scrubs? But then there's the biological supercomputer that is the Great Deku Tree. His roots go deep and far, and with them he's taken over a large portion of the forest surrounding him. And then there's the Deku Spore, a symbiotic fungus that grows in the Deku Tree's bark. This fungus can infect animals that come in contact with it. It halts the aging process of its host and takes control of its brain, and then makes them do stuff based on pheromone messages from the Great Deku. He loses control though if one of these hosts gets out of the range of his pheromones, so he only allows his most trusted followers to leave the forest, hoping that they had spend lots of Deku nuts and seeds, so that some of them could take hold in the land and extend the Deku tree's network. He wants this network to extend across Hyrule and beyond, to prepare for the takeover. In an attempt to thwart his plans, Princess Zelda has Ganondorf infect the Great Deku with a bug that lays eggs in its mainframe, but the Great Deku gets linked to exterminate the queen and severs all connection to the rest of his network, quarantining and sacrificing his main body, since he knew that he was already full of and just when everyone thought that the threat that the Great Deku posed was gone. Now these kids, who would serve the Great Deku for a very long time, they're actually the illegitimate children of a Hylian noble that were living at a nearby mansion with their mistress mothers, whom they killed in cold blood after getting infected with the Deku fungus. And after finding the bodies, their dad just abandoned the mansion, which became known as the Forest Temple. So the Great Deku tree has an insatiable lust for power and control, and if left unchecked, he'll slowly get his way. Such is the nature of the Deku. It's a little different in Termina though, where they have a mad scrub monarchy, which doesn't quite have the steady and calculating hand of the Great Deku. The Deku king would punish a monkey without any evidence of wrongdoing, whereas the Great Deku would simply turn the monkeys into his minions, getting as much use as he can out of them. Now as for the Sheikah, the so-called chosen guardians of the goddess Hylia, they're not really a distinct breed of people, although membership can be inherited. They are first and foremost a secretive order that serves the interests of the Hyrulean royals, in particular Princess Zelda, who from the perspective of the Hyrulean religion is the goddess Hylia's mortal incarnation. The Sheikah have existed since before the great split between the Gerudo and the Hylians, starting off as a loose assortment of thieves, assassins for hire, usurers and such. They jumped at the opportunity to benefit from coming under the wing of this new Hyrulean royal dynasty, who themselves are the sort to engage in piracy when not in power. Anyways, the idea of the Sheikah being a distinct breed of people is just a psyop developed by them. It allows them to do things like pretending to have been wiped out during a conflict, just to lay low, hiding in plain sight under new aliases. Their iconic red eyes and low melanin hair, which can be white while a Sheikah is still young, is mainly a result of excessive inbreeding within their clan, as Sheikahs would marry their cousins, and sometimes even siblings, to ensure that a family business stays within the family. They also 
also breed Odalaj as a necessary step in infiltrating the societies of the different peoples of Hyrule. This was in order to control the cultures of these people, in particular the Gorons and the Gerudo. The Sheikahs created cultures for them full of degeneracy and then tricked them into thinking that it's their own. The Gorons and Gerudo became proud of their new cultures, despite now living in environments where only the most degenerate were able to survive. And despite the Sheikah working for the Hyrulean royals, the Hylians weren't exactly spared either, which is the reason why Demise's Goron invasion failed. After being exposed to the proto hylian culture, the Gorons got caught up in their volcano of degeneracy and for once couldn't handle the heat. They just hadn't developed the same tolerance to degeneracy that even those earliest of Hylians had. The result was the Gorons basically defeating themselves. So to bring it back, the Sheikah engage in a lot of inbreeding and outbreeding. Those who do outbreed tend to stay with their assigned tribes for generations in order to infiltrate their society until they're almost indistinguishable from the rest of a given tribe, at least in the eyes of outsiders, which is why the main body of the Sheikah has seemingly dwindled to a handful. And by main body, I do mean the ones that look the most Hylian, such as Impa. In fact, she's like the spokesperson for the Sheikah because of her well-balanced features. Anyways, because of their degenerate breeding practices, the Sheikah had become very prone to mental disorders such as schizophrenia, and Sheikah works of art are characterized by unsettling faces. The Sheikah's shadow temple, also known as the royal family's closet on account of all the skeletons, also features statues of a strange bird creature placed at important points to one who would journey into the temple. These are in fact representations of a crow demon with an extra large beak and ears, which symbolically oversees the passage of the dead into the deepest shadows of Hyrule, with one of the final legs of the journey being a boat ride, which can only be activated by playing that special song known only to the royal family and their closest servants. At the deepest point in the temple is the lair of Bongo Bongo, a spirit that plays the song of death on the drums. He has severed hands and a single eye that sprouts out of his neck like a flower of death. He's also hung by his feet, all signs that he didn't have an easy and efficient death. Rather, he was tortured, being seen as a traitor to the Sheikah, because he invented the Lens of Truth, a tool which would allow even normies to see through Sheikah deceptions. When Link encounters Bongo Bongo in the Shadow Temple, who's actually playing the Song of Death because he wants to let go of his attachments and finally disappear, Link displays that he can see the truth in a test of combat which fills Bongo Bongo's heart with joy and sets him free. And the biggest impact his tool would have after these events was allowing Link to cheat at gambling. That tool's full potential was never realized, and the same could be said for the Lens of Truth. And then there's the Mask of Truth, a Sheikah tool that somehow found its way into the black market. This mask allows its wearer to read Sheikah intelligence reports. Now the Sheikah have many skills, but one thing that they're especially good at is turning people gay. They were even able to transform Zelda into her dyke form, known as Sheik, which beyond mere appearances, granted her a bonus to her physical strength. She also covered up one eye, just to show that she was really about the Sheikah lifestyle while it lasted. <laughs> One of Hyrule's greatest treasures and ultimate weapons is the Master Sword, which is a double-edged blade enchanted through blood sacrifice. You see, among the Sheikah, there's a long-held tradition known as the Cutting of the Cock, a practice which they eventually started pushing on to the general Hylian population, using all manner of piss-poor excuses, like saying that it keeps it cleaner. The only reason such an excuse had any legs in the first place is because they already turned a good portion of the population into sodomites. This practice drained young men of their sexual energy, making the Hylians more docile because sex became Became less pleasurable for them, with this effect being spun as being representative of what men have to sacrifice to have a stable society. So all this sexual energy was absorbed into Sheikah scalpels as they sliced through cock after cock. It was these heavily used scalpels that were melted down and forged into the master sword. This sword contains so much frustrated sexual energy that is taken on a will of its own and needs to be held in a scabbard with special properties. The master sword scabbard is made out of countless foreskins of the highest quality. Without it, the sword will inevitably end up taking control of its host. And making them shoot up a nearby school. And Link, of all people, damn sure isn't immune to falling prey to the sword, so he's gotta be careful. This is the reason why the Link of the Hero of Time era went through a whole bunch of trouble to get a sword made by Big Goron. Because with the Master Sword in his hand, he always runs the risk of being taken over. Now, funnily enough, the Master Sword is actually super effective against Ganon, because in his culture, almost everything sexual is haram. Aside from sleeping with Hylian girls, apparently, the Master Sword also has a second major use. It is so wretched with sexual frustration that the goddess Naru has sometimes granted her pity upon the Blade, granting it special time-based abilities that are usually triggered when it's placed into or taken out of a special hole called the pedestal of time. Like how in one timeline when a great flood began, the sword was placed into this hole which had been moved to Hyrule Castle, causing time to freeze in the castle, as well as creating a bubble-shaped barrier of frozen space-time which prevented Hyrule from being completely flooded. Now let's talk about money. 
Rupees are the currency of Hyrule. They're basically gemstones, acquired from places like Dudongo's Cavern. They are the official currency of Hyrule, but their use is strictly controlled, to the point where a lot of Hylians have resorted to using the barter system to make ends meet, which says something because it's really tedious, having to go through these long trading sequences to finally get what you want. The main method of control over rupees is the wallet system, which is so deadly serious that even Link has to oblige. Basically, every Hylian is allowed to carry one wallet whenever they're out and about, with the size of the wallet they can carry being limited by their family's power and social class. More powerful and wealthy families are privileged with bigger wallets so they can actually make large purchases and investments, while the peasants can only afford to pay rent, buy tools for their work, low quality food and drugs. Even though technically they could save up as many rupees as they can manage at home or in some hidden caches around Hyrule, the purchases they can make are limited to the size of their wallets, which are made using advanced Sheikah magic. These wallets can detect when someone is carrying extra rupees outside of their wallet or another wallet. These offenses cause the wallet to start putting out a certain signal. Basically, anyone who goes over their rupee limit has to immediately throw any extra rupees on the ground or risk being assassinated on the spot by the secret police. Like I said, it's deadly serious. The excuse for this system is that it supposedly cuts down on criminal behavior, such as wholesale drug purchases. Yet, all the big name criminals seem to have big wallets anyways. One of the major goals of the Sheikah is to develop wallets that can track every single purchase that Hylians make. That way, whenever those lower class Hylians try and make a move to get out of their situation, they can efficiently knock them down and steal their ideas. The Sheikah themselves prefer to deal in silver rupees, which a lot of Hylians like to call Sheikles. They like to set up puzzles in dungeons that involve quickly picking up all the Sheikles. Although they don't use real Sheikles, those are too valuable. They just use regular old blue rupees painted silver. Now, through these systems of control and privilege, the Hylian nobility strictly control the supply and flow of rupees through the economy by collectively deciding when to invest in businesses and jobs and when to hold on to their rupees and let the peasants starve. And even when they do invest in jobs, they save the best jobs for their friends, like the members of the Carpenters Union, who are paid to look busy and make simple jobs drag on forever. This brings us to the sad tale of Grog, whose father, Muto, is the head of the Carpenters. Well, actually, Muto isn't really his father. His wife cheated with the running man. The guy spends all day training just to fuck like a rabbit and leap out windows in a single bound. He sees himself as a hero in an era of declining Hylian birth rates. And when Link meets him in Termina, he's still banging people's wives as the mailman. And I mean, Grog looks a lot more like him than he does Mutau. And there's also the fact that Grog in Termina is the former runner and has the bunny hood, which is the running man's prized possession in Hyrule. By the way, if you're confused about the whole Termina Hyrule thing, the short version is that Termina is an alternate universe based on Hyrule. So the people of Termina are closely linked with their Hylian counterparts. So... Wu Tao always criticized Grog for how he's such a lazy deadbeat, while the sickly and pale looking Grog could only say that people are disgusting, especially his own mother and father. The truth is, Grog had a terrible ailment, an ailment which his mother, the potion shop hag, knew how to make medicine for, and she even expressed a slight interest in acquiring the ingredients in the Lost Woods. She never actually did anything to acquire them though, and neither did her husband, who as the head of the carpenter certainly had the resources to do so if he wanted to, but instead he ignores Grog's illness and calls him a useless slacker. Wu Tao must have instinctively felt that Grog wasn't really his, while his mother took notice of this and basically sold out Grog for brownie points in favor of her other child, the Cuckoo Lady, taking one of his dad's saws to collect the ingredients that his mother needs for that medicine, which he manages to do but no longer has the strength to make it back. That's where Link runs into him, unresponsive, but he does eventually manage to rouse him with the help of Grog's favorite bird, Kojiro. Grog gives Link the ingredient to make that medicine and sends him off to his mother, but before Grog could make it back, the forest had taken him, as anyone without a fairy who comes into the forest will eventually be lost and turn into a Stalfos. A lot of people in the know blame the Great Deku Tree for this phenomenon, nicknaming him the Great Sudoku Tree. So that's the sad tale of Grog. And while we're on the topic, what about the sad tale of Tingle? 35 years old and a fairy has never come to him. Just look at what it does to a man. <laughs> So Link, the hero of time, after having completed his mission and being sent back to his childhood, goes on a personal journey deep into the Lost Woods, but this time he doesn't have his fairy. And as I mentioned, according to this Kokiri girl named Fado, everyone who gets lost in the Lost Woods without a fairy gets turned into a Stalfos. You know, it's the kind of place where people who have lost their way go to find an ending. That's not Link's motivation though, at least not this time. He wants to find his old friend slash Wrangler Navi so they can reminisce about the good old days when they went to the future. In truth, Navi had actually ghosted him the moment her work was done. She was beyond done with screaming at Link just to maintain his focus. But even after months, Link wouldn't stop looking for her and she got tired of avoiding him. So she told all the Kokiri kids to tell Link that she would be traveling deep into the Lost Woods. Upon hearing this, Link threw caution to the wind and got lost in the woods. He got so lost that he somehow found his way into another universe. One created by the Goddess of Time, a more in-your-face reflection of Hyrule called Termina. The Goddess of Time, in other words, Naru, protected Link and his horse with her love so that he would make it safely without turning into a 
Delphos. She brought Link to Termina so that he could struggle and die for the sins of the Hylians, just like how Link was born and bred in Hyrule to fight and sacrifice everything for the royal family. In Termina, Link struggles against an entity known as Majora's Mask, which is a manifestation of the Hyruleans and their lies. You see, in Hyrulean society, everyone puts on a facade because no one can handle the truth. Thus, everyone lies to each other all the time, and Majora has absorbed all the negative energy from the memories of people dying from these lies. Because of this culture, the Hylians had developed a sociopathic tendency where they lie just for the sake of lying. It's become a part of their body's reward system, as simply lying gives them a rush of dopamine. So they do it compulsively, and the bigger the lie, the better. They'll keep lying no matter what, to the point of insanity, which is also manifested in Majora. The Hylians, and in particular the Hylian nobles because of their position, like the virtue signal, acting all self-righteous in order to gain the upper hand on honorable people, when in reality, they're willing to use others and discard them when they have no further use, like a puppet. This virtue signaling is the reason why Majora calls Link the bad guy, when in reality, Link is the most honest out of all the Hylians because he's so autistic. After Link receives masks containing many different energies from people all over Termina, he gives these masks to the four lunar children that surround Majora inside the moon, and in return receives the Fierce Deities Mask, more accurately known as the Ani Mask, which contains a powerful but relatively neutral spirit, a combination of the energy made up of Hylian memories, some good, some bad, which was contained in all the masks that he had traded in. In fact, this combination was orchestrated by Majora, who wanted all this energy to be in one place, one body, so that it could be destroyed through negativity and insanity. Speaking of insanity, giving this mask to Link, a proven powerhouse was Majora's last bad idea. Another thing to note about the allegorical land of Termina is that there are weapons with the power to turn people gay, which in Termina causes massive damage. Weapons like the Great Fairy Sword or the Sparkly Gold Dust Sword. And there's even a special kind of milk made from transgender cows, which makes a person's body surge with destructive magical energy. This is because in Hyrule, turning people gay has become almost like a sport with destructive results. Now, aside from Clock Town in the center, Termina has four major regions in each cardinal direction. The Swamp, where the Deku Kingdom is to the south, the mountains where the Goron village is to the north, Great Bay where the Zora as well as the all-female pirate clan, Termina's representation of the Gerudo reside in the west, and to the east is the land of the dead, the only place in Termina where can be found Triforce symbolism. There's two major factions in the land of the dead, the Ikana Kingdom and the Garo clan. The aggressive, warlike Ikana Kingdom built a tower that reached for the heavens, as if to challenge the power of, presumably the goddess of time, Naru, as she's the only goddess mentioned in Termina, just like how the Hyrulean royals made up a goddess named Hylia based on Naru, and then began to claim that the blood of this goddess ran in their family line. The Garo clan is made up of ruthless assassins who cut down anyone who stands in their way, and upon being defeated in battle, destroy their own bodies to keep their true ethnicities a secret, just like how the Sheikah has a past full of killing and otherwise destroying lives to get what they want, and pretend to be a distinct ethnicity as a Psyop, when in reality they're actually just a bunch of inbred mutts, and they weren't always working for the Hyrulean royals, with them and the Hylians at times being mutually hated enemies, which is why the Garo clan and the Ikana kingdom were at war even after becoming ghosts. Link travels to the land of the dead primarily to erase all these ghosts of the past so they don't become a burden on the present. In other words, Link symbolically erased the past so that people can't learn from it and will make the same mistakes in the future, which is just perfect for a country of insane compulsive liars. There's actually one more area, Milk Road, to the southwest of Clock Town, and at the end of Milk Road is Romani Ranch, which Link visits and ends up defending from interdimensional child molesters, followed by him getting molested, but in a good way. Not like how that dirty old man Ruraru helped take away his childhood when he slumbered for seven years. Now, as another example of how Termina represents the thoughts and memories and overall mental energies of Hyrule, in Clock Town, there's a street gang called the Bomber Kids. They keep close tabs on the lives of the people of Clock Town, writing every important bit of information down in their bomber's notebooks. And they put this information to use by finding people in trouble and offering to help them with their problems. Sounds pretty swell and all, but the thing is, there's a reason they're called the Bomber Kids, and that's because they expect to be rewarded for their good deeds and handsomely. Those who don't pay better not stay in town. <laughs> their businesses, their homes, and everything valuable to them will be bombed to smithereens in the wee hours of the night. These kids represent the deceptively predatory nature of many institutions in Hyrule, such as taxing already poor Hylians to pay for useless carpenters, or paying for a prison system which acts like a university for the most strong and predatory master criminals, which was justified in the first place because of problems that the Sheikah created to help enrich the Hylian nobles. The same nobles that piss out their windows onto peasants on the street and call it trickle-down economics. And if Hylians don't want to pay all these taxes, bad stuff happens. Important allegorical trait of Termina is the walls of Clock Town. Inside the walls, there is order, and people can live relatively peaceful lives. But outside is chaos, with dangerous creatures in every direction. The worst of all being the four temple bosses. They are all great devourers, or forces that wish to return the world to primordial chaos. They're also the corrupted form 
of the four giants that would normally maintain order, even being willing to tear apart a friend of theirs if he didn't stop causing trouble for the people of Termina. Bajor's mask is the one who cursed the giants and caused all this chaos, and due to insanity was bringing down an even worse chaos that wanted to consume everything. This moon isn't even really a moon, it's more like a spirit bomb created out of the Hylian's negative energy. When Link journeys into the belly of this beast, he finds himself in a peaceful meadow where the lunar children reside, which were representations of the buried consciousness of the Skull Kid, which Majora's Mask had by then completely taken over to gain full sentience, basically stealing a mind, because the mask alone can't think and needs to parasitize by overwhelming its host with negative energy. So by purging this negative energy directly in an epic battle, Link returned the Skull Kid's consciousness to him and avoided his fate of dying with this land. The Goddess of Time hadn't accounted for the powerful effects that the Song of Time, taught to Link by the princess, would have in this land. With it, he was able to avoid confronting all this negative energy until he was good and ready, and with the Song of Healing, taught to him by the Happy Mask Salesman, he gained the abilities of the Deku, Gorons, and Zora, and add the Ani Mask on top of all that, and he pretty much became the strongest Link in history. But upon his return, he saw that his deeds in Termina had no effect on Hyrule, no one would even believe him. Oh. And since he had been sent back to his childhood, no one knew about his deeds as the Hero of Time either. So even after all that, he had no fame and no guidance to compensate for his autism. He spent many years trying to make something of himself but failing, gaining wisdom but losing his sanity. Eventually, it all became too much and he returned to the Lost Woods. This time, he actually did turn into a Stalfos and became known as the Hero Shade. And after generations, the Hero Shade found himself in the position of encouraging and training a new Link. This Link would be known as the Hero of Twilight and lived in the era of twilight, called such because the kingdom of Hyrule, upon which it seemed like the sun would never set, was now in its twilight, and soon it would be the beginning of the era of the Goron. I'll get into all that soon, but actually, the hero of twilight wasn't even named such because he was invested in that issue. Actually, Hyrule had been invaded from a place called the Twilight Realm. You see, this is the timeline when the sages attempted to execute Ganondorf, but failed because the Triforce of Power came to him in his last moments. And since the sages couldn't kill him, they went with plan B and sealed him in the Twilight Realm using the Mirror of Twilight. The Twilight Realm is a place cloaked in twilight, where there always seems to be some major change just over the horizon, which never comes. And the twilight magic that gets used on the Hylians because of Ganondorf's machinations has the power of nihilism, which causes people to tear things down, reject, and destroy because nothing really matters. Which doesn't make sense, because if nothing really matters, why even care enough to destroy it? The people of the Twilight Realm, the descendants of a group of Sheikah who were thrown under the bus during the Hyrulean Civil War, had become immune to the nihilism because they realized that if nothing matters, then it doesn't matter if nothing matters. When the people of Hyrule get exposed though, they become subconsciously so disgusted with existence itself that they begin to reject their own bodies. And for some reason, Link gives in to his fur fag tendencies that he apparently had. And of course it all ended with Link beating on Ganondorf and not getting the girl or the other girl. Now before we move forward with this, the main timeline, I'll briefly mention a few others. Well before that, at the end of the era of Twilight, the TV was invented and the top rated show was loosely based on past events. Within this show, Ganon was no longer associated with any particular ethnicity and Link was always wearing different outfits and turning down pussy. Anyways, there's two other major timelines. In one, the Gerudo asked the King of Hyrule if they could use the Song of Storms to turn their land lush and green again. So the King trolls them by building a large music box at the top of a mountain in Gerudo territory, giving them way more rain than they could possibly need and the Gerudo lands get flooded out. But then the King panics because he realizes that nobody can reach that music box through the storm to turn it off. So Hyrule gets flooded and the Royals have to resort to piracy to slowly regain their power. Now here's the thing about sassy women. When a woman gets sassy with you, it means you're actually about to get cucked. It's a test, you know? She's saying that if you can't old masculine me, you're not man enough to be with me. In another timeline, Ganondorf opens portals to the sacred realm, revealing that this supposed sacred ground was actually full of all kinds of criminal activities that could be connected with the Hylian nobility, hoping to cause chaos between them and the peasants with this revelation. But unfortunately for him, the Hylians had become extremely docile after having their best and bravest killed off in wars for centuries, and they didn't raise a peep about it, which halted whatever further plans Ganondorf had. So that pretty much does it for notable timelines. Now I get to talk about my theory on what comes after the era of Twilight. The next great adventure of Link takes place in the era of the Black nobility. The Hylian nobles had fully succumbed to their own insanity. They had continued to spread degeneracy and effectively genocide their own kind until they had to learn the hard way, something that a sane person would have long since realized, that without your clan, you have nothing. And so the nobility got blacked by the Gorons, beginning this new era. But let's break down what happened exactly a little more to give you a better understanding. For starters, the nobles had a scientist on their payroll push out the Out of Death Mountain theory, which suggested that everyone, all peoples, originally 
came from the Gorons' homeland of Death Mountain. This was a Saya to encourage the Hylians to mate with Gorons, creating mixed offspring that could usually pass for full-blooded Gorons, all so that they could gain access to the rich resources of Death Mountain, which as I mentioned was formerly colonized, but the Gorons had scared the Hylians off. The nobles wanted those Gorons precious rocks, and they didn't care how. They even started rewriting Hylian history to make it so that Gorons were always present in major events. And for their part, the Gorons totally ran with it, claiming that more and more Hylian kings were in fact actually Gorons. And it kept going like this, until it reached a point where people started wondering if the Hylians even ever really existed as a distinct people. Now another major factor in the downfall of the Hylians was when the Hylian Kangs decided to create feminism, which gave women huge advantages in the job market, granting them access to high paying, influential positions which they have no legitimate reason to be in. This ended up making vagina way too expensive. Almost no Hylian men could afford vagina anymore, which caused most of them to turn gay and a lot of them to go to the Lost Woods. Because roses are red, violets are blue, sakura petals are pink, it's time for seppuku. In reality, these kings and nobles were just being dicks for setting this up. Because women are different when compared to men. And if they truly wanted equality, they could have just convinced Hylian men to breed with the most self-sacrificing women they could get their hands on, instead of coming up with all this bullshit to troll straight men, which caused Hylian numbers to dwindle to nothing within a few generations. Now you see, the reason I bring up the trait of being self-sacrificing when it comes to equality is because it's men's most valuable trait. And it's the trait which women who want to be men avoid at all costs. They are all the bravado, but without the willingness to go through hardship, which is why Anju in Termina is best girl. She was prepared to die waiting for her husband. Now it used to be that even though Hylian men tend to have autism, the Hylian women would still give them pity sex to prevent them from shooting up a school or something. And this was enough to sustain the population. But when the Gorons finally caught up to the Hylian males in terms of currency, it was no competition. Sure, they weren't as smart, but they also weren't handicapped by autism. And they had the support of all those blonde Hylian women in high positions. The Gorons and these Hylian women teamed up against the Hylian men to make it hard for them to get laid. You see, the main strategy that Hylian men used to get laid is pure persistence. So these Hylian women and Gorons orchestrated new laws, making it so that Hylian men's persistence is now viewed by Hyrulean society as sexual harassment, which of course caused the Hylian population to go into a free fall. This was all done in secret while the Gorons were still pretending to be weak. In reality, all these Hylian women in high positions were only hiring Gorons, and not hiring any Hylian men at all. They worked to bring in the Gorons by giving them jobs. Funnily enough, this whole sexual harassment thing that they threw at Hylian men was just another form of degeneracy, because persistence is a sign of a good husband. Aloof men won't make good providers or fathers. So by criminalizing persistence, they threw the baby out with the bathwater. They came up with all this crap about toxic masculinity to fuck with Hylian men. Even though the positives to masculinity far away the negatives, they still chose to solely focus on the bad. Another thing that the Hylian nobles intentionally did for the longest time, which may have finally backfired, was call the Hylian population. Their preferred method of doing this begins with them killing off Gorons and Gerudo and the like in their homelands using drugs and war, and then flooding in their best to provide competition, which effectively calls the Hylians. The weak and lazy would die, which kept the Hylians just strong enough to be to the nobles' liking. But of course, eventually, the scales became so tipped that the Hylians as a whole started dying. The same sort of thing was also done using degeneracy, which mostly hurt the Hylians, but the few that were truly strong and defiant remained unaffected. Now, yet another factor that led up to this was Hylian men getting trolled by genetics. They would reproduce with Goron and Gerudo women, feeling proud about it and thinking that they were cucking those women's people. But in reality, the Gorons and the Gerudo had more dominant genes than the Hylians. So these Hylian men were pouring their resources into these kids that looked nothing like them. And it certainly didn't help that Goron and Gerudo women tend to pop out a Gerillian kids because they're so low inhibition, and have stronger bodies than the Hyrulean women, who tend to look haggard after popping out just one. So what all these Hylian men were really doing was devoting their resources into spreading Goron and Gerudo phenotypes. The Hylians actually even went so far as to invent something called the Pyramid of Power Bed for mating with Goron females. Because in the beginning, they had issues getting it up with these females, due to a lack of sexual dysmorphia when it came to their faces, but they had very voluptuous bodies. So the triangle-shaped bed allowed them to sleep together without waking up face to face with each other, or having to wake up to the smell of feet. All in all, the Hylian men had an instinct to spread the wild oats if you would. In other words, to have lots of kids that they don't invest in. While at the same time, this instinct is suppressed in them by the rules of society, which is why they do things like breeding outside of their clan, even though they know that their kids aren't going to look like them. But they proceed and then hit on their own kids for being mixed anyways. Now as for those blonde Hylian women who got with Gorons in mass, there's a good reason for this. These educated and well-paid women are willing to get knocked up by low inhibition males, because after a while they understood what Hylian men knew all too well. These women's careers were cock-blocking them, and since it takes two to tango, they weren't getting any either, leaving these women frustrated and vulnerable to anyone who wants to knock them up. All their education and money earned means nothing to these Hylian women. It does cock-block Hylian men since they earn more, but these low inhibition Gorons will always seem sexually attractive to these women, because when it comes down to it, frivolous things like
like money and education barely enter into it when it comes to basic attraction. And even a few Princess Zeldas mated with some darker skin, low inhibition men because they got insecure about having no eyebrows. To put it yet another way, the Master Sword is egalitarian. It's so egalitarian that it takes the Hylians a few hundred years before they pull out because women should always come first. It couldn't compete with the curved Peroni Sword of the Gerudo, which could hit the Z spot every time with every stroke, or the Big Goron Sword, which was too big to be called a sword. Massive, thick, heavy, and far too rough. Indeed, it was like a heap of raw baby daddyum. Just think of Hyrulean society as a mildly radioactive substance. It already has its problems, but then when you enrich it using raw baby daddyum is when it truly becomes unstable. In the end, the Gorons had killed off almost all the Hylians because they had gained the ability to conspire after mixing with them. The only Hylians left were the ones they purposely kept alive, like this scientist. The Gorons had kidnapped him and forced him to invent weapons for killing the Hylians. They would torture this scientist by cucking him, banging his fat wife right in front of him, which took its toll, especially considering that he's an autistic savant that needs his wife to survive. So after realizing that he could never please his fat Hylian wife like the Gorons could because of their gorilla strength, lifting up his wife, throwing her around, and doing things to her that before she could only dream of, he gave up hope of ever escaping, and became a nihilistic slave of the Gorons. But after mating with the Goron bull, his wife ended up birthing a Link. The bloodline had survived, and this time Link was a half Goron and half Hylian. Link's Goron father left soon after his birth, and his mother was extremely abusive. After a very rough childhood, Link had a bonding moment with the scientist, who gave the boy the secret weapon that he had invented to get back at the Gorons. The Master Gat, which fires bullets laced with the essence of child support. The scientist even adopted Link, because he knew it's a cruel world in the land of the black nobility. Because Gorons are very efficient at killing each other, and due to natural selection, no ordinary weapon would work, which is where the Master Gat comes in. The only problem is, Link can't Z-target, because Gorons can't aim. So Link finally has a use for all those rupees he picks up, having to constantly buy more ammo. Now the state of affairs in Goron society at this time is the result of the Gorons having figured out the final trick of the Hylian nobles. That final trick being that they control the narrative of government, and the heads of the Goron, Gerudo, and Zora governments were all under their control, which is well shown when the heads of those governments appear in the Hyrulean Hall of Sages. To deal with and overwhelm the strategy of the Hylian nobles to control the narrative, the Gorons split themselves into countless sub-military groups, all with different plans to take down the Hylians, and there was just no way to infiltrate all of them in time to stop the Hylians from getting blacked. So the world that Link ventures into is made up of countless small factions left over from that era, all competing for territory and bitches. The only one who could bring peace and unity to the Gorons now was the descendant of the man who had almost led them to black the Hylians in the distant past, Ganondorf, and this time born as a Goron again because the Triforce of Power had recognized the coming of a new era, and him and Link's past are destined to cross. So that about wraps it up guys, I hope you enjoyed my theories. Until next time, this is Sassy saying don't get lost in the woods.